Lions of Tennessee. Let's take a look at the standings in the SEC. We're going to give the victory to Florida against Georgia. They're up big time as we speak right now. South Carolina at 2-3 and three in conference play. Tennessee at 1-4, and four, but still plenty to play for. Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Jones along with Bob Davey. Thanks for coming aboard. You know, Philip Fulmer has won a national championship at Tennessee back in 1998. He also has two SEC titles to his credit, Bob. But one of the burgeoning storylines coming into this contest with his team struggling is about his job security. Well, Mark, Philip Fulmer is not naive. I mean, he is totally aware of those rumors swirling on, on, around out there about his job security. But trust me on this. I've been in that situation. Philip Fulmer right now is focused on one thing, find a way to beat South Carolina. Because the reality, if Tennessee can do that tonight, they can win out, be 7-5, and five, and play in a bowl game. So his focus is on one thing, and that's these game cuts. Bob, on the other side of the field, South Carolina comes in with and four of their last five games. They look forward to their schedule, and they have big things in mind. Well, I know you love these coaches' sayings. <laughs> they remember what you do in November, and that is perfect for South Carolina. I mean, last year they lost their last five games. Bad taste in everyone's mouth. Didn't go to a bowl game. This year they have some momentum. Have won four of their last five. Mark, they can finish out strong, have a great season. You know, South Carolina in their history has one 10-win season, one one nine win season in the history of the school. So Steve Spurrier is on track if they can win tonight. South Carolina coming off a of bye week and getting themselves right. We're going to see two of the top defenses in the nation tonight, led by Eric Berry and Emmanuel Cook, a couple of hard hitting safeties, respectively, for Tennessee and South Carolina. This has always been historically a very competitive game. Just a season ago, it went right down to the wire and into overtime before Tennessee finally came away with the victory, but that game was played in Knoxville. It's a game that South Carolina remembers to a man. If you ask them what they're thinking coming to this contest, they're talking payback. South Carolina coming off a very humbling loss a couple of weeks ago at the hands of LSU. They haven't played since. They've got a couple of new pieces to the puzzle. A main one at quarterback. Here they come onto the field. of antagonists familiar with one another going head to head Fulmer against Spurrier Tennessee South Carolina when we come back Columbia, South Carolina. Under the lights, Tennessee taking on South Carolina. The Gamecocks winners in four of their last five games, and it's the type of game, folks, that Bob Davey is a former head coach and former defensive coordinator. Kind of wraps his arms around, Bob. Two great defenses on the field tonight. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. I mean, we've been the last two weeks in the Pac-10 and the ACC, and I told you this week when I talked to you on the phone, <laughs> when you put that tape on of these SEC teams, when you watch Alabama, Tennessee, when you watch South Carolina, LSU, it's for real in this league. And these are two really, really good defenses. South Carolina comes in number four in the nation. Tennessee comes in number 14. I know you love points. They're not going to be a lot of points tonight. Mark. <laughs> We're thinking about 21-14, maybe somewhere in that neighborhood. Well, Tennessee winning the toss, deferring to the second half. South Carolina will receive. And this is Captain Munnellin starting from his own five. And Munnellin brought down outside the 20, makes it out to the 24-yard line as we take a look at the impact players for the Gamecocks. Steven Garcia going to be making his second start at quarterback. A new face in a new place, but a lot of talent. And Jared Cook, really a wide receiver playing tight end. He is their leading wide receiver at 6'5", 242. And Bob Kenny McKinley, a guy that Steve Spurrier talks about trying to get more touches for coming into this game tonight. First down and 10 for South Carolina at the 24, and uh, now a late player coming onto the field. Into formation, Saunders. 
hand it off to Davis, and Mike Davis is brought down right at the line of scrimmage. Take a look at the starting lineups for South Carolina. Running across the top of your screen, Steven Garcia completing 61% of his passes with three touchdown passes against two interceptions. The South Carolina offense, rushing offense, 108 out of 117. Of course, they've given up a lot of sacks which gets negated from those rushing yards. But I don't think South Carolina is going to run the football a lot tonight. Yeah, LSU sacked quarterback Steven Garcia six times a couple of weeks ago. Davis running the ball between the tackles in a nice gain of close to eight yards. Gets out to the 32-yard line. Davis, a 5'9 senior, averaging about four yards a carry. He has twice as many carries as anybody else on the team coming into this contest tonight. It'll be third down and about two to go. Steve Spurrier feels that his new starting quarterback, Steven Garcia, gives them a chance to do some special things. And Mark, in the reality, South Carolina is not going to be consistent on offense until they get consistent play out of their quarterbacks, which they have not had. On third down, they hand it off. Davis again, and he's going to be stopped up apparently just a little bit short of the first down, according to that spot in that line you have on your screen. Robert Ayers, the 6'3", 270-pound senior, making the stop. And you have to wonder, as Steve Spurrier goes with three straight running plays, is he going to play a little bit conservative, Mark, because this Tennessee offense has really had trouble scoring. I don't think he's going to stay conservative long. That's just not his nature. Those two words don't usually go together. That's Dennis Rogan back deep, standing on his own 25, ready to get this punt from Spencer Lanning. Rogan's at the 25. Brought down after a three-yard return on that punt. A 42-yard punt. And it's going to be first down and 10. Here's the starting quarterback for Tennessee, Nick Stevens, making his fifth start of the season. Taking over from Jonathan Crompton several games ago, Arian Foster, the team's leading rusher. And, and Bob, Eric, I know you like Eric Berry. Oh, you teed me up on Eric <laughs> Berry now. He's a defensive back, strong safety, but the guy is dynamite, dynamic with his hands on the football, whether it be interceptions, picked up fumbles, or even playing a little bit of offense. That's five picks on the year right now, watching as his offense has the show. Stevens fires complete at the 40. Nice catch and run on the play. And Tennessee with a successful first play. Taylor making his first catch. A 27-yard pickup. Yeah, Nick Stevens off the play action. They're working on Captain Munnerlin, the corner, who's had a virus all week. And Lucas Taylor, the senior receiver. What a great confidence boost here early. Taylor, all SEC a season ago. The team's leading receiver coming in. First down and 10. At the 45 yard line, Stevens working out of the shotgun. A little confusion right here by Tennessee, which really, Mark, has been a trademark of the Tennessee offense. And they have to burn uh -huh. one of their timeouts. And let me say this if they were playing in Knoxville right now, that crowd would be booing. And Philip Fulmer, right in Stevens' kitchen right now, his eyes. Tennessee a little disconcerted, having to call a timeout a few moments ago. First down from the 45-yard line. Arian Foster, the lone back beside quarterback Nick Stevens, who's working out of the shotgun. And another flag thrown on the field. Actually, that's the first one of the game. Bob, we talked about the fact during the break that during that Alabama-Tennessee game, things got a little bit ugly towards the end of it. Mark, let's wait and see what this penalty is. I'd be surprised. There will be no foul. No foul for false start. Yeah, and it, you mentioned it did. I mean, and that's the reality at a place like Tennessee with the high expect expectations. But I was thinking coming in here, probably good that Tennessee's on the road tonight. <laughs> the bubble screen complete. 
Terry Jones back after missing last week with an ankle injury as we take a look at the starting lineups at the top of the screen. But, Bob, just to finish off on your point. Yeah, the reason I say that, you know, and I was thinking coming through this South Carolina crowd, you know, when you play on the road, you expect the boost. And the boos you use as motivation as the visitor. But when you play at home and get booed, that's demoralizing. So at least you can use it for motivation here when you're the visitor. The team needed three wins to become bowl eligible. Tennessee comes in at three and five. A seven-yard pickup on the last play by Gerald Jones, who limped off the field after the play. That's Foster running over the left tackle. Chris Scott brought down by Jasper Brinkley. Brinkley coming back this season after knee surgery. The South Carolina defense, those big linebackers. Brinkley and Norwood, fourth-rated defense in the country. Hard to line up and run the football. Nick Stevens, like he did on that first play of the game, is going to have to make some plays throwing the football. Here come the Volunteers out of the eye on third down and short. They give it to the fullback, number 45, Kevin Cooper. And depending on the spot, it looks like he's going to be just a little bit short of the first down. Just as South Carolina was on their offensive sequence of the game. And decision time, they're in a good part of the field, Bob, to go for it. And Philip Fulmer's place kicker this year has struggled tremendously. Daniel Lincoln has had a tough time of it. He's 8 of 15 so far on the year. And Phillip's hoping right now he doesn't have to make that decision, which I think he would go for it on fourth down. This is about as close as you can get on a spot level. This is very close. They're going to give it to him. They've got a pretty gracious spot. And Tennessee moves the chains. First down and 10. You watch this Tennessee offense. You know, the biggest thing I can see, the biggest problem, aside from some silly pre-snap penalties, Mark, they give up a lot of penetration up front, particularly in the running game. Defensive lines get in the backfield on them, which give the running back no chance to get started. It's kind of surprising because they have everybody back on the offensive line from a season ago. First down and 10. Steven sets up the screen and incomplete. Nobody was expecting it over the head of Foster. And it'll be second down and 10. For Tennessee. Well, anytime you have a new offensive coordinator in a new system and you have a new quarterback like Nick Stevens, you know, he started the last four games, but he is a young, young guy out of Dallas, Texas. You offended him a little bit. Flower Mound. Flower Mound. Suburbia. He yeah. jumped all over you when you said Flower Mound. He said, no, that's that guy. <laughs> Big city. Second down and 10. Maybe I've said that. Stevens given time, looking upfield, caught, but out of bounds. Intended for number 21, Austin Rogers, who couldn't get a foot in bounds. It'll be third down and 10 for the Volunteers. Captain Munner in on the coverage. A great effort right there by Austin Rogers. A right foot coming down on the shot. Exactly, Mark. Sets up a third down and long. This is where South Carolina loves that three-man defensive package up front. Then they use Norwood, number 40, a lot of times as the fourth rusher. Stevens to pass under some heat. He leads one tackler, but couldn't get away from the second and third one. Eric Norwood, who we mentioned a moment ago, the first one to arrive. Former freshman All-American making the sack on the play. Now the initial pressure is Darian Stewart, the strong safety, coming on the blitz. Nick Stevens does a good job, but there's Eric Norwood, 40, who I think is one of the most dynamic defensive players in the Southeastern Conference. About 250 pounds. They moved him from defensive end to linebacker, but they use him a lot in pass rush. Had some great players on defense, the Gamecocks do. Ricky Colquitt punting to Captain Mullen. Watches it go out of bounds. It's going to be marked just inside the 20. 
Well, when it came down to South Carolina or Arkansas, he's one of the faces of that Gamecock defense. Back with more right after this. The Halloween was over. Right. <laughs> Zero's on the scoreboard. I know when our crew walked in that production meeting, <laughs> there was some Halloweening going on last night. I think those guys stayed out a little late, a couple of those guys, and uh, overdid the costume thing. Dressed up as TV production people, right? Yeah, we had one as uh, Richard Simmons dressed up as Richard Simmons. <laughs> Here's Garcia. He can move and make plays like that with his feet. Complete to Kenny McKinley. Who they've been trying to get to ball to a little bit frequently, much more frequently, during the last couple of games. He picks up 19. Yeah, you said it, Mark. I mean, Stephen Garcia, he gives South Carolina hope for the future at quarterback. And I think the biggest reason is his mobility. And you saw it right there. Richard, sophomore out of Tampa, Florida. First down and 10 from the 37. Complete little receiver screen to McKinley again. They get him a touch, and he is combustible, making something happen into Tennessee territory at the 45-yard line. Got a nice block from Jared Cook to pick up 18. Anytime you throw those wide receiver screens, you have to have the other receivers block. And big Jared Cook, 84, who's really a tight end but lines up out there, a wide receiver right there, gets an excellent block. First down and 10 from the 45. Little screen underneath. And the 28 Eric Baker. Baker on the move. Nice straight arm all the way down to the 14 yard line before Morley finally pushes him out of bounds. A 31 yard gallop for Eric Baker. Nice to see him come back after a fumble in the LSU game a couple of weeks ago. Anytime you have an aggressive defense like Tennessee with an attacking front, those screen passes are great weapons against an up-the-field attacking defense. Steve Spurrier's offense picking up the tempo a little bit, going much quicker seemingly. Mike Davis back into the ball game, first down and 10. Garcia. Tiptoes out of bounds at the 12-yard line. Tommy Beecher started the season at quarterback, gave way to Chris Smelly for the next six games. Steven Garcia took over a couple of weeks ago as the starter against LSU, and that's how South Carolina got to this point. Well, one thing you know, there's always somebody in the bullpen when it comes to quarterbacks <laughs> with Steve Spurrier. But, you know, Steven Garcia has started. Last week he started, played the whole game, or two weeks ago the open date. Uh, against LSU, so he seems more committed to Garcia right now. Out of the pocket again, complete, wide open. Touchdown, Davis. that old cardinal rule don't ever throw back across your body in the middle of the field unless it's for a touchdown unless it's for a touchdown <laughs> <laughs> under eight minutes to go south carolina the first team to get on the scoreboard brian suck up in for the extra point the game cops lead it Again, seven to nothing you see garcia Kind of a gunslinger mentality, also the mobility, but Mark, no, no, no. Oh, great throw. <laughs> That's the way it goes. How much do you think he liked it, too? Four for four during the drive. Steven Garcia with his fourth, make that fifth touchdown pass of the season a few moments ago. He was a perfect four for four on the drive. Moving his offense down the field, five plays, 82 yards in a minute 38, and South Carolina on the scoreboard first. Seven to nothing, unlike last year's game between these two teams when Tennessee jumped out to a 21 nothing lead before relinquishing that lead. Finally winning it in overtime. What a beautiful day here in Columbia. Huh? Probably 70 degrees. Great atmosphere here in this stadium tonight. Hancock's playing some great football. They've won four out of their last five. 
As Tennessee will start off on its own 20. We go back to Wendy in the studio. Bob, thank you very much. We've got a Taco Bell studio update. USC playing host to Washington, and this one could get ugly. Already the scoring has started early and often. Mark Sanchez to Patrick Turner, 14-0. Then now it's 21-0. You know, I heard last night, Wendy Nix went to Wofford. I was watching that Appalachian State Wofford game, and, and uh, she's a Wofford grad. Unbiased? No, I don't know about that. Probably not. I'm not sure about that. You can ask her the next time I, I go will. back to the studio. I'll have to throw it back to her and see if she was objective or not last night about this. No, I didn't check the sources on that, but oh, I think okay. that's accurate. <laughs> Zach back at the 13-yard line, a late flag down as Stevens goes down at the 13. Jasper Brinkley in there to make the sack. Brinkley, the real face of that defense, along with Eric Norwood for South Carolina. Mark, I mentioned the penetration that this Tennessee offensive line holding. Number 50 on the offense. That penalty is declined. We'll play second down. They are very susceptible to penetration. Now, against Alabama, I thought they blocked the blitz very well throughout the game, but particularly in the running game. And that is amazing. The timing in their running game is not exactly right. They're not in sync between the line and the backs. Well, we saw the number on the graphic. They gave up four sacks all of last year, Bob. Already this year, they've given up 13. Out of the shotgun, second and long, the handoff. Right back to the line of scrimmage is Arian Foster. who ran for 1,200 yards a season ago in 07. This year, much below that productivity-wise. And a good part of that is you know, the offensive line that you alluded to a few moments ago. Yeah, and he's not really a big play kind of guy. I mean, he's the most versatile, the most complete running back they have. Probably Lennon career number three. The young tailback is the most explosive of the three they play. Third down and 17 for Nick Stevens. Pressure coming from Munnerlyn. Stevens gets it off in time. And it was scooped off the carpet at the 29-yard line. Incomplete. Eric Norwood there applying the pressure along with number one, Captain Munnerlyn, who's shaken up on the play. Well, Captain Munnerlyn has been fighting a virus. Had, he's had a, a tendency with cramps. Remember, we did yep. them last year. He had a problem with cramps. And anytime you have a virus, the first thing is dehydration. So that could be a big concern for them. Munderland, one of the top performers in the secondary. And during the pregame, it was interesting to observe him on the bench. Uh, doesn't seem like he's got an abundance of energy right yeah. there. Yeah, and, you know, South Carolina, Mark, is a man-to-man -man coverage team. They don't play a lot of zone. And the reality, those corners and man-to-man, -man, it's a lot more demanding physically down after down to be chasing a guy all over the stadium. He does a lot of things, too. We've already seen him on special teams returning punts, although he'll sit this one out. Instead, Akeem Augusti is back for the punt. Britton Coldwood, who missed five games earlier this year because of a suspension. Back punting what, out of his own end zone. When Colquitt hits it, he hits it. Now. He is a great punter. A long line of Colquitts that have held down the punting position at Tennessee. And wow, that is an outstanding punt all the way back to the 38-yard line. Big game coming up tonight in the Lone Star State. Two top ten unbeatens face off this week in a high-powered Big 12 matchup. Heisman frontrunner Colt McCoy and number one ranked Texas head into Lubbock with plans of defeating Texas Tech. But the seventh ranked Red Raiders with quarterback Graham Harrell and wideout Michael Crabtree will try to continue their ten-game winning streak by taking down their lone star rival. College football action continues tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern on ABC. That's what I'm talking about, Bob Davy. Chuck and Duck and sleep in the streets. That pass broken up intended for Kenny McKinley. Broken up nicely by Eric Berry, the safety we were talking about in the pregame show. Arguably the most talented player back there in the secondary for Tennessee. But let's go back to that game down in Texas tonight. Who do you like? If you had to pick one, I'm going to put you on the spot. I can't call that. Now, but I know this. Love it, Texas. <laughs> Particularly when you're at the University of Texas or Texas A&M. When either one of those two schools come into Lubbock, uh -huh. it is tough to win because hatred is not too strong of a word to use <laughs> for what people in Lubbock think of UT or A&M. 
Second down and ten. A little pressure coming. Pass incomplete intended for Gar uh, Garcia. Throws it for McKinley. Yeah, Mark, we go back to this first drive. Steve Spurrier, two screen passes, one to Kenny McKinley, then to the running back, Mike Davis. That's a great play call early in the game against an aggressive defense. Then you see the ability right there of Steven Garcia, but it's the screen pass, which is a great neutralizer to an aggressive defense. See what they do here on third down and ten. Garcia given time and overshoots his intended receiver over the middle. That's Jared Cook. And it's fourth down, which brings on the punting unit led by Spencer Lanning. And let's get back to Stephen Garcia. Bob, how tough is it playing quarterback for a guy that has a Heisman Trophy in his office, Steve Spurrier? I think it's a great situation. I mean, you look. Now, you have to have thick skin. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't be a timid <laughs> guy. You can't get your feelings hurt. But he's going to coach the heck out of you. I think it's a great situation for a young talent like Stephen Garcia. Garcia says if coach isn't yelling at you, he doesn't care. Actually, enjoys it. Rogan back at his own 19, eludes one tackler. A flag thrown, and Rogan brought down at the 27-yard line. And a nice punt by Spencer Lanning, which traveled 43 yards, eight yards on the return by Rogan. Again, the penalties. You know, Tennessee's probably going to get a block in the back right here on this return. And when you have an offense like Tennessee's that's struggling for everything they get, that body language right there by Phillips says it all. I mean, a penalty throws you completely off rhythm. There's no flag. There you go. For a legal block in the back. We determined that the block was from the side. He's a little smile right there, that fella, wasn't it? Did you see that? <laughs> oh, he's smiling inside. He, he just hasn't told his face yet. <laughs> but get your weekly dose of NFL news and analysis on ESPN tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Chris Berman and the crew with NFL Countdown presented by IBM. Then at 7 on ESPN, Chris Berman and John Saunders delivered today's highlights and scores on SportsCenter presented by Bud Light. First down and 10 from the 27-yard line for the Volunteers. It has been a struggle offensively for them all season long, and now we get a look at Lennon Creer for the first time in the ball game, and a nice gain of about six yards on the play. He's the game breaker that they have out of the troika of tailback spot. Yeah, he is the big play guy, and you know this is an amazing statistic right here: 13 straight quarters without a turnover. Normally, when you have a struggling offense, Tennessee's 112th in total offense in the country. It usually coincides with turnovers, but that has not been the case for Tennessee. It has been real puzzling as to why this team has struggled at times offensively. Here's Greer again picking his spots. It's about three on the plate. It'll be third down and a long one coming up for Tennessee. Tennessee 0 for 3 on the road so far this year as they come into Columbia. 3 and 5 overall, 1 and 4 in conference play. And as always, the spotlight when the team struggles falling on the head coach. Rick Fulmer in his 17th season on the sidelines, coaching his alma mater. Third and one. Clear dotting the eye. He gets the call. Cut back, and I'm not sure that he's going to make it. He was tripped up there by Marvin Sack, the 5'11 senior. Again. The biggest problem in this run game is penetration. You're going to see Sapp right here just come around the back door and get in the backfield. He just runs right by the fullback. They're going to bring the chains out and measure to see if he got it. Wow. That brings on Britton Colquitt in the punting unit for Tennessee. Little things. Yeah. Little things. I mean, that won't show up in the box score tomorrow or in the statistics. But circle that lack of third down conversion right there as this game progresses. A three and out for Tennessee. And, you know, going back to 07, there was a streak of 71 consecutive games where the starting punter had Colquitt as his surname at Tennessee. Colquitt's with a great history, and that's Captain Munnerlin back in the ballgame returning this punt. Good about eight Colquitt's punting, right? It only feels that way. 
from the 23-yard line. Munnerlin calls for the fair catch. A 41-yard punt, nothing on the return. A look at our BCS storylines here in the first Saturday in November. Well, the Longhorns, as you mentioned, in Lubbock tonight. Can Colt McCoy keep it going? I mean, Graham Harrell, at times, that offense is unstoppable for Texas Tech. Utah and Boise still trying to work their way in as a BCS buster. And how about the Florida Gators? What did it end up, 49-3 to today? I think the meter's against still Georgia? running. And you look at what the BCS number one and two teams have done in the month of November. It hasn't been very good to them. Eric Baker in the backfield. Garcia fires a little bit high at the 43-yard line. Incomplete intended for Jason Barnes. And when you fire high for a South Carolina receiver, Garcia, that's doing a lot because you look at the receivers, Bob. 6'5", Cook. Barnes is 6'4". There's some big targets out there. Yeah, South Carolina is a good-looking football team. Down on the field, you mentioned it as well. Just across the board, a bunch of good-looking players. Funny how when I wear those tight shirts, it doesn't look the same. <laughs> well, they've got a little confusion right here, formation-wise. Second down and 10 out of the shotgun, Garcia. Flag down and the pass incomplete at the 32 intended for Saunders. Yeah, they're going to get them for an illegal formation. I would think not seven men on the line of scrimmage. Tennessee had one of those last week on a critical third and short that they actually converted the first down on against Alabama. Illegal formation. Only six men on the line of scrimmage on the offense. That penalty is declined. We'll play third down. Third down and long coming up now for South Carolina. Better keep your eyes on Eric Berry, number 14. The guy is amazing in the secondary as far as interceptions and returning interceptions. We can see the screen McKinley with a couple of blockers in front of him. McKinley brought down from behind on the play by number 99, Ben Martin. He picked up nine just short of the first down, but once again, there's a flag on the play. Still trying to figure this out. It looks like Tennessee is going to decline the upcoming penalty. Holding. Number 84 on the offense. That penalty is declined. It'll be fourth down. So Spencer Lanning comes in to punt. A hold against the tight end and leading receiver Jared Cook right there. Dennis Rogan. Back at his own 25-yard line. Logan catches it, avoiding the fair catch at the 26-yard line where he's brought down immediately after the 42-yard punt. Mark Jones along with Bob Davey here in Columbia, South Carolina. Tennessee, Bob, just 3-5 and five in the season. Full former has been a very successful coach at Tennessee. 150 victories against just 50 losses, but there's a lot of pressure on him to win this game tonight. Uh, there's no question, and you and I are both so impressed with him. You know, you meet with coaches every week, and when you meet with Phil Former, what you see is what you get. You know, he's an old offensive lineman. He's been through this before. He's going to keep fighting that. I mean, there is no back down in Phil Former. Stevens fires complete. Nice timing on that play. Caught by Austin Rogers. He picks up eight yards on the play. Fulmer says that, hey, I'm not like one of those dogs that sits on the porch, barks, then runs in the house. I'm going to go to work and try and get this football team ready to win out. Well, and you know they're sitting here three and five. They win this game tonight. They have Wyoming, Vanderbilt, and Kentucky. All of a sudden now, they're in a bowl game as a 7-5 and five team. So this game tonight is critical. Make no mistake about that for Phil Fulmer in Tennessee. Was just a season ago, they won 10 games played in the conference championship game. On the reverse, 
Number 27, Arian Foster, brought down by Eric Norwood. And you look at the company that Philip Fulmer is in, he's some in a very select fraternity amongst the winningest active head coaches in college football right now. When you talk about Joe Pa and you talk about Bobby Bowden and Jim Tressel, that's a good group that you're named with. Well, in the reality, he's lost to his three biggest rivals, Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. The success Urban Meyer has had at Florida, and then Nick Saban turning it around so dramatic at, at Alabama, everybody gets impatient. Stevens back to pass, giving plenty of time this time. Complete underneath to Jones, and Gerald Jones stopped up at the 42-yard line. Jones doesn't appear to be his usual explosive self. He's coming off that ankle injury. And he's their most dynamic player. But you, you look at Phillip, I mean, it's obvious what the issue is. This is a team that's 112th in offense, Tennessee, and they are 14th in the country on defense. So it's about executing on offense, a new offensive coordinator, a new system, a new quarterback. This play accounting for six yards. It'll be second down and four. They run it again between the tackles. That's Foster who picks up the first down for the Volunteers on a seven-yard gallop bump back to Philip Fulmer. We saw a demonstration of how he's helped his team inside running drills, inside running drills. Their practices have become a lot more physical. Exactly. I said an old offensive lineman himself, <laughs> an old offensive line coach, there's only one way to solve your execution problems and go out there and practice. Now, with that comes a toll because not only are you playing in the Southeastern Conference coming off the Alabama game, you have to go practice physical. So this football team is a tired football team to some degree compared to South Carolina, who's coming off an open date. On first down and 10, Stevens looking downfield, complete over the middle, incomplete. Dropped at the 35 by Quentin Hancock, number 87. Seemed to have it in his arms. Yeah, just watching this Tennessee team, and I've seen them over the years. They are not as skilled and dynamic at wide receiver. Now, you have a hard time blaming that one on Dave Clawson, the offensive coordinator in Philip Fulmer, don't you? I think that ball probably should have been caught. I'd go with you on that. Second and ten. From midfield, Foster. Brought down at about the 46-yard line. Nice stick on the play by Emmanuel Cook, who is a Bob Son Sanders type player. Sanders with the Colts, and uh, man, he came up and delivered a blow on Foster that time. Yeah, and when you say Bob Saunders, Sanders, you are exactly right. I mean, he is a drop-down safety. They call him a safety, but he is down there like a linebacker most of the time. 5'10, 215. Again, you see South Carolina in the three-man front with Eric Norwood as a rusher. On third down and five. Complete out of the backfield. Nice spin move by Foster. And depending on the spot, let's see where they mark it. Boy, they gave him a good spot right near the 40-yard line, close to the first down. A pickup of five on the play. Nice move by Foster, and he got enough for the first down. Man, he put it on spin cycle and got enough. Yeah, you said a great spot and the fans booed, but one thing I noticed, nobody on that South Carolina sideline said a thing. Mm -hmm. So that must have been a great effort by Arian Foster right there to stay in bounds. Watch right here. Ooh, that right toe was close, wasn't it? Yeah, they're going to review that, I believe. Well, Foster is the senior and the leader of the running backs along with Hardesty a junior and career sophomore now let's go back and take a look at that if we can come out it's about the right toe the previous play <laughs> yeah. is under further yeah. review these guys do a great job now I mean because that right toe looked like it was on that line. As we slow it down, watch right there. No. Mm. I don't think you can overturn it. No. That's not now. conclusive. Different angle this time. It's the next time he puts his right foot down there. You can't really see it as well. You can't see it there. Now, he did a tremendous job of extending that football. 
Better wrap it up, though. He's got one hand on I'd have to say he's still yeah, in bounds. I think at that he point. was, and I'm telling you, having coached a long time, when there was no reaction by that South Carolina coaching staff, that told me a lot. I think that's going to remain a first down. Yeah. Tennessee can use all the help they can get. We mentioned how inept they've been at times offensively, ranking amongst the bottom feeders nationally, amongst FBS teams. You know, we talked about the new offensive coordinator at Tennessee, Dave Clawson. Most recently, the head coach at Richmond, where they had great success. But he'll be the first one to tell you they have struggled in many different ways. Here we take a look at uh, After Dave review, right there. the Came ruling on the field stands. It is a first down. That's Tennessee's third first down on this drive. One thing you can tell, the effort of the Tennessee players has not wavered. And that shows me that this football team is still capable. They are still accepting coaching. And they have a chance not only to win this game, but finish with a successful season. I mean, effort is not an issue. So if they get this playoff in time, which they won't. Now that's an issue. Yeah. That's going to be the end of the first quarter. No flag. Last year's game against South Carolina proved to be a catalyst for a five-game win streak. Night for a game of college football. Well, uh, drawn him up on the sidelines for the offense. See the coach drawn up that right there on the board. That's one reason sometimes the home team is on the opposite side of the press box because there's a tendency for coaches to look right down opposing coaches wow. and look and see what the coach is drawing. A little espionage involved. Picked off at the 35-yard line by Woodson, and he has nothing but real estate. Touchdown, Gamecocks. Talked about Tennessee not turning the football over. That's their first turnover in 193 plays. Add one more problem to that list for the Tennessee offense. It was clear sailing for Woodson on his third interception of the season, the seventh of his career in the Gamecocks with a 13 to nothing lead after that big play. Ellis Johnson's defense has been nearly impregnable for most of the season. Johnson coming in and replacing Tyrone Nix, who left for Ole Miss. And those kinds of plays, it's clear to see why he was recently given a one-year contract extension here at South Carolina. The defense putting the Gamecocks up 14 to nothing. And Nick Stevens trying to go to Josh Briscoe right here. I mean, the ball clearly should not have been thrown. Stoney Woodson, another one of those corners in this South Carolina defense. I think their secondary depth-wise and experience-wise is as good as any in the country. And after the interception was thrown, Nick Stevens, do you think he had a chance? He wasn't getting up from that. He could try, but to no avail. Clifton Gathers lowered the boom on him. That insult to injury. Well, in the character and the fiber of your football team, and I'm talking about Tennessee, it was tested last week against Alabama. It's really being tested right now after a turnover like that. That was the first interception that Stevens has thrown in his last 107 pass attempts. And I'll tell you, Nick Stevens is a fiery guy now. Redhead. You remember last week against Alabama, Josh Briscoe came up short on a third down conversion. Josh Briscoe was smiling on the bench. And I mean, Nick Stevens went up and got right in his grill now. Yeah. Rogan back deep for the kick. 
this going to go out the back of the end zone. And uh, I want to know, Wendy Nix, did you maintain your objectivity last night when Wofford was playing? Well, Mark, I have to tell you, if you saw the way that one went down, it was relatively easy after they kicked off to be objective. It was somewhat like this one. Ray Malaluga with the interception. That would lead to a Stephon Johnson one-yard touchdown. USC's defense has been so good this year. They've shut out two of their last three opponents. And judging by the way this thing's going right now, it looks like it might be number three. 41-0. Boise State, 21-0 over New Mexico State. BYU and Colorado State, gentlemen, knotted up at 21. Back to Columbia. I never thought Wendy would be one of those fair weather fans. I thought she would be with the Wofford Terriers, good or bad. She jumped off the boat early on that game last night, didn't she? Broke her ankles jumping off the bandwagon. Yeah. Jonathan Crompton now, new quarterback in for Tennessee. He started the season at quarterback against UCLA. Had a rough game. That pass intended for number 81, Briscoe, who made the catch. Picking up eight on the play, but Jonathan Crompton, the 6'4 junior, you know, he came off his progressions a little bit early in the first game against UCLA, and it was never the same since. Well, and you know right now, Philip Fulmer, I won't say this is an act of desperation, but he is trying to get a spark any way he can for this football team. Now, what does it mean, Bob, when you pull your starting quarterback, Nick Stevens, this early in the game, we just started the second quarter of play. Do you risk losing him if well, you do that? I think Phillips worried about losing a lot more, maybe, if he doesn't make that move. But number there's the problem the right there. The pre-snap penalties. But I think you have second to down. do what you have to do. I mean, he knows the pulse of his football team. He knows what kind of state mentally Nick Stevens is in right now. And he knows how his teammates are reacting to Nick Stevens. So Philip Fulmer makes the call, but it's tough to go back to Nick Stevens. Second down and seven coming up. Compton. Pass a little bit high and incomplete. Helplessly at the 23 intended for Arian Foster. But this is a great opportunity right now for Jonathan Crompton. He gets a chance right now. It may be a short-lived opportunity, depending on how this goes, but you've seen guys like this come off the bench and spark struggling football teams. The problem is the South Carolina defense, particularly on third down and seven. Now. Everybody loves a redemption story, and that's the opportunity for Jonathan Crompton in Tennessee right now. Crompton coming in here early in the second quarter to take over quarterback for Nick Stevens, who threw an interception for a touchdown a few moments ago. The backside pressure, he gets rocked, fumbles it, recovered by South Carolina, but was he down first? Well, Chris Culliver, who was a wide receiver last year, hit him right in the back now. Watch Culliver coming on the blitz right here at the bottom of the screen. They have one more than they can block. I mean, he didn't even think about wrapping them up now. He just butted them in the back. I think Cliff Matthews, 83, comes up with that recovery. They're going to say no. that he was down. And Tennessee will punt. Brenton Colquitt standing on his own two-yard line. Captain Munnellen back at his 35. A high, nice punt by Colquitt. Calling for the fair catch is Munnellen at the 36. A 46-yard punt. Nothing on the return in the South Carolina Gamecocks. Out of the gates pretty quickly, leading 14 to nothing, and the defense rising up. Plays ago, Bob, is this a fumble or not? I think uh, Tennessee had a huge break right here. Culliver hits him in the back. To me, that football was out, and Matthews recovers for South Carolina. I saw no reason that that would have not been a fumble. Colquitt punting it away. It's first down and 10 from the 36 for the Gamecocks. Eric Baker, the deep back, dotting the eye. Garcia hands it off to Baker. And Baker's forward progress out to the 37-yard line where Rogan makes the stop. Let's take one more look. Well, let people at home judge for themselves. Culliver hits him in the back. I think that football is coming out clearly, clearly before the knee hit the ground. And Cliff Matthews does recover. Surprised that was not a fumble. Especially in this day and age when they review any play that seems to be even borderline. Second down and nine. 
Nice run by Eric Baker, the 5'11", 188-pound freshman. Ends up about a yard shy of the first down, gets seven on the play. The third down and short coming up for the Gamecocks. You know, when you look at quarterback Steven Garcia, great lineage when it comes to those football bloodlines. His brother Brian, and they're going to go quick here. Gary also played football. Both of them playing collegially at Harvard, and Garcia keeps it himself for the first down. And he's been involved in a couple of incidents, Bob, and... Uh, Part of his makeover included cutting his hair and his locks up. <laughs> yeah, he wanted to be a little less visible. <laughs> Enrolled early as a freshman out of high school. Missed both springs since he's been here because of disciplinary suspensions. But I don't think there's any question about his talent. And I love his makeup. He's a fiery disposition. First down and 10. All at the 47. Garcia with a play fake. Plenty of time and making it a little bit of time. He's it incomplete at the 27 yard line. Number 85, Joe Hills laid out, but couldn't squeeze it. And that looked like a catchable pass to me. Sets up a second down in 10. You know, I think the thing about Stephen Garcia, you know, it's well documented the problems he's had here at South Carolina off the field. I think key for him, he has to prove he's a leader, he's accountable, and get the trust of the coaches and the other players. But according to Steve Spurrier, he's taken every step possible to do that. He accepts coaching, and that's the biggest thing. Bring himself into a leader. This is Davis on the handoff. Davis getting to the edge and close to the first down at the 45-yard line. Picks up eight on the play. And back to Garcia, you know, you alluded to the alcohol-related incidents going back as far as February 07 and as recently as March of 08. And he had to do certain things to get back in the good graces of head coach Steve Spurrier and the administration, including drug and alcohol testing and 40 hours of uh, community service work. He has seemingly rehabilitated things. A good haircut never hurt either. <laughs> That's Davis. Close to the first down, and we have a red zone alert in the Oklahoma-Nebraska game. You know the great thing about college football and life in general, I guess, is you always get a second opportunity. And Steven Garcia now has what some people may say is a third opportunity, but what's in the past isn't important. It's what he does with this, and all accounts including getting the haircut. <laughs> He's becoming a leader on this football team. Garcia, a highly recruited quarterback out of the Tampa area, and his offense about that much short of the first down. And a chorus of goes he, raining down on head coach Steve Spurrier. A yeah. little bit of a rumor, more than a rumor, that Steve wasn't the offensive coordinator. He turned that over to his son. Looks like Steve was looking at that call sheet right there <laughs> making that call to me now. It looked like a script in his hand, didn't it? Yeah. Interesting call right here, though, isn't it? I mean, fourth and short, you have the game, all the momentum as we look at Steve Jr. up in the press box. They keep the decision-making in the family. This isn't a conservative call. I mean, this is... Davis out of the offset eye. Garcia keeps it himself. Not sure that he had enough push up front. That yeah. Tennessee defense responded. Dan Williams in there, 55, who most people didn't think he would play this week because of an injury in the Alabama game. Well, Bob, it was a tough week defensively for Tennessee last week. They had five starters injured, including Williams, who's their bell cap. Yeah, and Dan Williams with the ankle. Great penetration right there. Go ahead and make that call, Mark. Try to spot that football if you're coming in there. I'm going to say that he didn't get enough, but that's hey, from four stories up. This is huge are. right here now. Didn't make it. Did not make it, so the gamble doesn't pay off. Okay, let's go back to this. Tennessee dodged the bullet, in my opinion, with the sack by Colliver when the ball was rolled, I guess, down. And now they stop him on fourth down. Could this be turning the momentum right now for Philip Fulmer? One more look at the last play. The official came on during the commercial break and said that the play 
on the field stands as called. And really, Mark, that's three series in a row that Tennessee's turned the football over. The first, an interception for a touchdown. What I think should have been a fumble the next series on the third down sack, and now this fumble right here by Creer. You look at this bench, what you really worry about is that look in those eyes right there, but offense against defense when the offense is struggling so bad. A little shell shock over there on the Tennessee side of the field into the end zone, touchdown, McKinley. turnover by the Volunteers leading directly to South Carolina points. McKinley with his third touchdown catch of the season, the 18th of his career. And it's 21 to nothing for the Gamecocks. This seemingly, Bob, in danger of slipping away a little bit from Tennessee. Well, there isn't any question about that. And, uh, Tennessee will be severely tested, obviously, right now. I guess the first decision, what do we do at quarterback if we're Tennessee? Do we continue to go with Crompton? Do we go back to Nick Stevens? But you know, their problems offensively run much deeper than just inconsistent play at quarterback. I mentioned at the top of the show, Philip Fulmer. Won a national championship with the Volunteers back in 98. Has a couple of SEC titles to his credit as well. But the struggles right now continuing to mount as Arian Foster comes over to the freshman, Lennon Creer, here and says, I would think well, you gotta you got to give yourself a check well, up from the neck this. up and keep it good. There's about time when all the talking stops. I've seen a bunch of talking over there on that Tennessee sideline between players. It's time you just play and take care of your responsibility. Well, Stevens was at the center of some talking on the bench a few moments ago. Yeah, I mean, there's only so many psychologists and psychiatrists we can have on the sideline, right? <laughs> it's about time to play. <laughs> You know, it's one thing offensively if you're 112th and struggling and not turning the ball over, you give your defense a chance. But when you're 112 and then turn it over, you give the defense no chance. South Carolina with 14 points off of two Tennessee turnovers. Ball's going to get a chance to return this one. This is Rogan. Started out from his own goal line. A nice return out to the 28, back to the studio, and a very objective Wendy Nix. You guys are showing me no love tonight. Objective and not off the bandwagon, I must say. Oklahoma, Nebraska, how about Joe Gans, the INT by Dominique Franks. 14-0, number four Oklahoma over Nebraska. Gentlemen? All right, Wendy. First down and 10 from the 28-yard line for Tennessee. Jonathan Crompton back in for his third series of the game. He took over a while ago from Nick Stevens. Foster the lone back on first and ten. Foster getting the edge. Picks up about three on the play before he's brought down by Jasper Brinkley. And as a head coach, you have to be so mentally tough. You cannot show any panic. You have to try to remain as positive as you can, as difficult as it is right now for Phil Fulmer. And this, uh, well, reports his attitude during the course of the week it has been good. Demeanor has been good. Captains, he said, are showing good leadership. So far, no payoff on the scoreboard, though. Second down and six for the Volunteers. Brompton fire is complete. At the 38-yard line to Brandon Warren. Fulmer, a former offensive lineman at the University of Tennessee. He was an assistant coach before taking over as the head coach 17 seasons ago. Well, he came there as an 18-year-old offensive guard. Been there 34 of the last 40 years. Gave $1 million, he and his wife, to the university, I believe, just last year. So he has a lot invested in that orange uniform there. Think about the difference a year has made. Last year they won 10 games, went to the SEC championship game, and a New Year's Day bowl game as well. Third down and three. Crompton has it batted down at the line. Number 95, Nathan Pepper. 
Batting it out of the air to set up a fourth down for the Volunteers. Yeah, big Nathan Pepper, 95. Watch him bat this football down the nose guard right there. I mean, that was thrown right into his chest. Come on, Bob. You showed some vertical leap there. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that hit him right on that Carolina right there. But how about Nathan Pepper? Knee injury last year in the third game on an interception return for a touchdown by him. Wow. So a defensive lineman finally gets one, but he hurt his knee. Fifth punt of the night for Colquitt gets off a high spiral. And Munnellin watches it bounce at the 30, and it's going to be down at the 27-yard line. Well, on the eve of this year's election, two of the NFL's best battle in the nation's capital. So cast your vote to watch Big Ben and the Steelers take on Clinton Portis and the Redskins. Monday Night Football on ESPN at 8.30 Eastern Time. Coverage begins at 7 Eastern with Monday Night Countdown delivered by UPS. And Jason Campbell, a former SEC standout at Auburn, now captaining the ship for Washington and putting up some good numbers this year. How about getting that game in Washington, D.C., right? Yeah. With the election right around the corner. At halftime, Chris Berman going to be interviewing the presidential candidates, Barack Obama and John McCain. On first down and 10, Eric Baker with the carry. Baker got about three on the play. It'll be second down and seven. 8.15 to go here in the first half. A first half in which South Carolina has come up and made all the big pivotal plays. Second down and eight coming up. Garcia hands it off to Baker. Baker with a nice run. Going to be about two yards short of the first down. And Garcia making just his uh, second start, doing a nice job, Bob. Yeah, and you see the number one attribute, I think, is just his escapability in the pocket. Thrown against the grain to Mike Davis right there. The touchdown to Kenny McKinley. Been some offense, but the real story of this game has been South Carolina's defense and the turnovers. Stephen Garcia with some Tennessee. interesting hobbies. He collects uh, swords. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> make me a little bit nervous. Mike Davis in the backfield in uh, South Carolina, a little bit disconcerted offensively as they call a timeout. Their first, the first time out of the of first half. half. Talked about Garcia's brothers playing football as well collegiately at Harvard. Got a little, both brothers at yeah. Harvard, huh? Take a little SAT. He just doesn't look the same without the visor, but he's the same coach. Steve Spurrier's team leading 21 to nothing. 7-21 to go in the first half. Third down and short for South Carolina. Garcia keeps it himself. He's a very proficient runner, and he gets the first down out to the 40-yard line. Picked up four on the play. Little Tim Tebow right there on the predetermined quarterback run. He gets up limping a little bit. You know, watching this Steve Spurrier offense over the years, how they've changed. You know, it used to be an eye formation, sprint draw, sprint draw pass. Did a lot of the empty no-back stuff. He is kind of like everyone else now with the shotgun offset back offense that everyone in college football is going to. First down and 10. And they're no huddle. You know, they say they've joined the ranks of that. Davis on the carry. Got back to the line of scrimmage where he was brought down by Dan Williams, the 6'3 senior who suffered an injury last week in that loss against Alabama. And good to see him back on the field. Uh, there's a lot of subjectivity as to whether he was cut down by an illegal block or not. And, uh, the economics major back. One of the valuable players up front, Bob. Yeah, he is an active guy. A lot of credit to him coming back off that ankle. Because I don't think anyone expected him to play tonight. Second down and ten for the game cuts. Hands it off again to Davis. And Davis brought down at the 43-yard line, picks up three, and uh, the players losing their hats on the field. Think about Eric Berry, watching him on tape. He is an excellent tackler. I mean, he is a physical guy now. You know, sometimes you get a playmaker that's an interception kind of guy that wants to be a finesse player. 
But right there, I mean, he tackled a little high, but he got him down. This guy was a quarterback in high school. His dad played at Tennessee. He's only 19 years old, been elected permanent captain. But the most impressive thing to me, yeah. he'll hit you. <laughs> Five interceptions, two on the season. Garcia back to pass. Garcia going to try and make it happen with his legs, but he's brought down at the line. Oh, got about three yards on the play out to the 46. You know, I'm looking at the stats. It's amazing the slow starts that Tennessee gets off to. In five Southeastern Conference games this year, five games, they had three points in the first quarter. They've had 22 points in the first half compared to the opponent's 70 points. So one thing, just slow starts gets this team in the hole. Bob, fourth punt of the night for Spencer Lanning of South Carolina. Timeout. Tennessee. You know, the good thing about Stephen Garcia of South Carolina, the quarterback, at least on that last run, he wasn't hit by an official, Bob. And, <laughs> and that can be called progress because a little while ago, their last game, watch this against LSU official Wilbur Hackett. You know, you could call this a forearm shiver, Bob. Well, you can tell he was a three-year starter at Kentucky. Now, fortunately for Wilbur, <laughs> South Carolina scored on that drive. But the great thing about it, Wilbur is back tonight. And earlier in the game, had an opportunity to be in a controversial position again. But because he's such a great athlete. Yeah, great agility. Watch how he gets out of the way of this throw. Saw this one coming. I mean, that's an athlete. Yeah, it's obvious right there. Well, he wasn't close enough to make a hit, so he had to duck. <laughs> but has he received more face time than any umpire and more, what is that, YouTube viewings than any umpire, maybe in the history of college football this past week? A lot of hits for Wilbur Hackett Jr. Dennis Wilgen back at his punt. Nice sidestep. He's met by a host of tacklers at the 17-yard line. Tennessee trying to make things happen. Wilbur Hackett Jr. Uh, played at the University of Kentucky. Actually was the first African-American captain at the school. Back during 1968 to the 1970 season was the leading tackler three times at UK. Let me tell you one thing about umpires and officials in general. They're kind of like deep snappers. They want to be anonymous. <laughs> they do not want a lot of publicity. Yeah, that's too late. <laughs> we got a lot of love exactly. for Wilbur. A lot of love for him, though. I mean, Wilbur will hit you now. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say that about many officials. Pass complete to number 81, Josh Briscoe, still fighting for extra yards. And brought down at the 22-yard line, picked up three on the play, and Jonathan Crompton remains the quarterback of the moment for Tennessee. And you have to be surprised about that. You know, I wonder if there's more than just the interception that Nick Stevens threw. I mean, that's a quick hook for a guy that it's his first interception. He's still trying to explain yeah. over there on the sidelines he's been exactly doing a lot of, what's happening. He's been doing a lot of John with some of his teammates over there, Bob. Second down and seven in the last four possessions for the Volunteers. It's been two turnovers and two three and outs. Brompton over the middle, high in traffic and caught off the rebound. Foster, man, you talk about being in a very auspicious position. Arian Foster didn't draw it up like that, but he'll take it 26 yards. Well, again, Crompton drills it into coverage right there. I mean, there's three Gamecocks around him, but Arian Foster, they said he was the most versatile, most complete guy. Tell you what, Culliver wanted to get another one right yeah. there. Almost had it too, but instead, Foster there to make the catch and a first down for the Volunteers. Still no points on the board with 337 to go in the first half. Compton wide open and tipped. Jeez. Incomplete. Let's check in with Wendy Nix for a sports center right now. Mark, thank you very much. They are on the board in Lubbock, Texas, courtesy of a safety. Chris Ogbenaya tackled in the end zone by Colby Whitlock. That puts Texas Tech up by two. They are also on the Texas 12 and driving. Sam Bradford to Jermaine Grisham. A nine-yard touchdown strike makes it 28-0. Oklahoma over Nebraska. Sports Center after this game on ESPN. All right, Wendy, a great battle going on down in Texas. Right here, it's 21-0. The Gamecocks leading the Volunteers. Tennessee 
Looking to get the ship right. And a stop on Arian Foster. No gain on the play. Dustin Lindsay moving in to make the stop. Lindsay, a 6'4 senior, and he's fond of saying, you know what, I'm ready to blow somebody up. <laughs> I'm not sure where you got that, but research. I'm taking your word for it, man. I, I'll tell you someone, this guy Ellis Johnson right now has done a tremendous job. First year back here in South Carolina. He and his wife are both from the Columbia area. What did he tell us? He was from Winsboro, though, Winsboro. which is a suburb of Columbia. It says the population there hasn't changed in some 50 years. Third down and 10. Crompton under heat and brought down. They heated him up. Marvin Sapp with the sack. The fourth one for South Carolina tonight. Well, you're going to watch Marvin Sapp come on the blitz right in the A gap. It really doesn't matter who your quarterback is. <laughs> when you come that clean on a blitz, obviously Josh McNeil, the center, Anthony Parker, the right guard, I hate to speculate because I do not know what the protection was, but one thing to watch on this punt, I've noticed these up backs right here coming back into the punter, and they are very close into the punter now. South Carolina setting up a return. Underwood watches it bounce, and he pounces on the loose ball at the 21-yard line. Jimmy Johnson continues his march toward a third straight Sprint Cup title as the rest of the chase field tries to hold him back. The chase for the NASCAR Sprint Cup continuing with the Dickies 500 at Texas on ABC tomorrow afternoon. Coverage beginning with NASCAR countdown at 3 Eastern. Jimmy Johnson way out in front. Bob Davey, Carl Edwards in second, Greg Biffle in third, and... You know, kind of a quiet week on that front. No, no fights in the pits or chokings or punches thrown. Nothing but left turns in practice. 155 to go in the first half. Davis, and he's brought down behind the line of scrimmage at the 17-yard line. Tennessee's offensive line getting coached up on the sidelines there. The sacks have been an issue. To well, see. and you know, they cleaned up the blitz pickup problem last week against Alabama. But this week, I mean, they are getting blitzed every passing down by Ellis Johnson. And right now, they have no answer for pass protection, Tennessee. Good the news for their quarterbacks, Crompton or Stevens. Second down and 13 for South Carolina. Davis weaving his way beyond the 20 to the 23. Let's go back to Wendy in studio. Mark, thank you very much. Jesse Palmer and I will be with you at the half. We'll have the very latest from that showdown in Lubbock, Texas and Texas Tech. And don't think for a minute the Gators didn't remember Georgia's end zone celebration last year. I'll show you why they did. And I'll tell you what player today went above and beyond in another wild day of college football. We're back in just a minute. Take you through to the other side. Right now, though, Mark, back to you. All right, Wendy. Third down and nine coming up for the Gamecocks. I'll tell you, those Florida Gators. Jesse impressive. Palmer had to be impressed with that output today. Davis on the draw. Sack behind the line of scrimmage at the 20-yard line by Rico McCoy. It's all time out yeah, right Tennessee now, Marcus. can make something happen yeah. here. This has been a, been a series dominated by Tennessee of late. They've won 14 of the last 15 meetings between these two teams coming in. But uh, the 21-point lead tonight, the largest against Tennessee since way, way back. Well, you look at Tennessee, you look at South Carolina, Mark, every Southeastern Conference game they've played this year has been decided by seven points. And I look at this South Carolina team, they are close, in my opinion, to getting over the hump. Mm -hmm. They are very close right now. You know, they've won four of their last five games. They can finish this thing off and have a great season. They're close. Steven Garcia coming in as the new quarterback uh, just a couple of weeks ago against LSU, making his first start, now making his second start tonight. Bob, 
we've watched him throughout the first half. He seems to be, when given the opportunities, going through his progressions much better than he did in that first game when he had a tendency to just take off. Yeah, and he, he had that tendency against LSU, obviously, two weeks ago. He's a guy that would take off and run in a heartbeat. He just needs, needs to be more patient, give the pass protection, give the pass routes a chance to develop. Tonight, it's all about just managing the game, though, because you can see Steve Spurrier is playing this a very conservative because, bottom line, Steve has no respect right now for the Tennessee offense. He doesn't think Tennessee can score. In the big picture, you look at South Carolina's schedule, and Steve Spurrier echoed these sentiments when we spoke with him yesterday. He said that they could finish up very strong, perhaps a, an eight, maybe even a nine-win yeah. season yeah. when you project a little bit. And they, they've only had, what, one ten-win yep. season, one nine-win season in the history of South Carolina football. So they're sitting here with Arkansas, Clemson, and they go to Gainesville after this game. So they have a chance to finish this thing up strong right now. And right now pitching a shutout in the first half leading 21 to nothing a beleaguered head coach Philip Fulmer benching his quarterback right now let's send it to Wendy Nixon Jesse Palmer for the college football halftime which is the Vista and we are back under the lights here 21 to nothing South Carolina leading Tennessee I'm Mark Jones along with Bob Davey. Tennessee going to get the ball to start the second half here, Bob. This is a game rife with urgency for them. they got to turn the beat around. How do they do it, especially offensively? Well, I know the first thing Steve Spurrier told his team at halftime. Last year at the, in this game in Knoxville, Tennessee was up 21-0 on South Carolina. Almost a game like this, and South Carolina came roaring back, ended up losing in overtime. But for Tennessee, I mean, they've got a lot of problems, let's be honest, particularly on offense. They need to decide which quarterback, just go with them, and execute better. There's no magic, or Phil Fulmer would have already done that from a scheme standpoint. You just need to play for pride and execute right now. Fuller's had a great record against South Carolina in the past 14 and one lifetime against the Gamecocks. It hasn't gone that way tonight, though, for the Volunteers. Rogan on the kickoff return, going to be brought down right around the 20-yard line. But the story of the night, the defense for the Gamecocks. Well, we start with Eric Norwood on the sack right here. And pressure all night. Stoney Woodson on the interception. Not only intercepts it, but scores. This is another Culliver sack in the back. Here's Sapp on a sack. Constant pressure, constant blitz on passing downs. Tennessee with 90 yards offense in the first half. You see Captain Munnerlyn made a couple of big plays defensively for South Carolina. Nick Stevens back at quarterback to start the second half here and completes his first throw, and it's a big one. All the way down to the 32-yard line, Austin Rogers makes it a great start for the third quarter for Nick Stevens, who has returned as the starting quarterback here. A 49-yard pickup. Well, Nick Stevens with a little pump fake, kind of a double move. What a great way to get this half started for Tennessee. South Carolina missed the tackle right there, but Nick Stevens coming off the bench. Big first completion right here. Completed the first pass of the game, if I remember yeah. back in his first completion of the game. Didn't go so well after that for him. Aaron Foster the only back. A little play action. Given all day to deliver, and it's a little bit low at the 15-yard line. Intended for Gerald Jones. It'll be second down and 10. I'll tell you, Emmanuel Cook. The safety from South Carolina broke on that football. This kid right here can be a first-round draft choice, in my opinion. I believe he's just a junior. Yeah, sure is. 5'10", and a real portrait of toughness. I remember last year he played in the Georgia game just days after his appendix rupture. That's toughness. This is Foster. And Foster brought down inside the 25-yard line at the 24. Sets up a third down coming up for the Volunteers. And you really have to think right now, Tennessee, this is four down territory, in my opinion. So your third down call to me is effective knowing that you're going to go for it on fourth down.
Stevens with time. Incomplete at the 20 yard line. Great defense that time by Carlos Thomas. He was very close, Bob, to getting there a little bit early. He almost jumped that right. Well, Carlos Thomas, you said it. I mean, he had a big interception against LSU, returned it 47 yards. He undercut the receiver right there, almost took it to the house the other way. But this surprises me right here. I would have thought Philip Fulmer would have ran that ball on third down, knowing he was going for it on fourth down. This is a fourth and a long three right here. Three of eight on the season on fourth down. They've got to get to the 21. You better protect that passer because they're going to come after you. Good protection, but incomplete. At the 17-yard line, the Gamecocks will take over on downs. Lucas Taylor was the nearest receiver. The intended pass, Captain Mullerlin, defending for South Carolina. Again, they contest every throw. I mean, their defensive backs are in the grill of the Tennessee wide receivers. Let's see if this was pass interference right here. Couldn't see it there. But, Mark, I go back to the third down call on third and about three and a half. The decision had been made to go for it on fourth down. What a great opportunity to run a draw or something and make it really unmanageable fourth down. Mike Davis in a tailback, and Davis gets the call here. Great penetration to thwart that play by number 91, Robert Ayers. Ayers, a, a South Carolina native, number 91 for the Volunteers, was really looking forward to making a homecoming of sorts, playing in this game in Columbia, but he told every one of his teammates willing to listen that, guys, this is a business trip. This is uh, not a field trip or a fun ride for us. That's been much fun at all for quarterback Nick Stevens. Yeah. Steven. Second down and nine. Garcia under duress and throws it away. That won't be grounding. He's outside the tackles. Nonetheless, third down and nine coming up. Good heat provided by Bolden on the play. The Monty Bolden of Tennessee. Not many times are you going to see Steve Spurrier only throw the ball 12 times in the first half. That was only their 13th pass attempt of the game. They only have 145 yards total offense, South Carolina. Third and long for the Gamecocks coming up. Garcia, 6 of 13 passing on them. Try to set up the screen complete. Davis has the first down and then some. Out to the 38-yard line. Good execution by South Carolina. And a nice run, a pickup of 13 yards by the senior Mike Davis. They've had success tonight with the screens. I mean, that's the second middle screen that Mike Davis has caught. You know the beauty of that play? As long as the ball is thrown behind the line of scrimmage, completed behind the line of scrimmage, those big linemen are allowed to be downfield blocking. And that is a huge advantage in college football. I mean, if the NFL had that, they'd throw for 200 yards a game on screen passes. You know, stopping him. Eric Baker now in for Davis in the backfield, dotting the eye. Baker on the call, and he's going to be brought down behind the line of scrimmage and a loss of about a yard on the play. Let's go back and look at this screen pass. You see where the line of scrimmage is right here. Now, let's take a look when this ball is caught where the line are. Stop it right there. There's a lineman right there downfield. There's a lineman right there downfield blocking, but it's totally legal. And look at that cavern open up in the middle of the field. In the NFL, you are not, not allowed to block until the ball is completed, regardless if it's caught behind the line of scrimmage. Officials really got to be watching to make sure that it is behind or else it's blocking illegally downfield. Right? Yeah, they do a great job. Garcia delivers downfield complete a strike. All the way down to the 35-yard line, Saunders making the grab. Saunders picks up 27 on the play. Yeah, Wesley Saunders, he's the blocking tight end at about 285 pounds. You see him just wide open. I mean, obviously a broken coverage. Saunders had a 26-yard touchdown against LSU. Two great-looking tight ends for South Carolina, yeah, Jared Saunders. Cook and Saunders. Saunders showed some mobility on that touchdown run you alluded to a couple of weeks ago. It pretty well, and this is Eric Baker. Baker gets about three on the play. You have to go back to that fourth down non-conversion by Tennessee. 
you know, there's such a football team right now that's so fragile. By not making that first down, you have to wonder if this defense now is starting to cave in like they did in the second half against Alabama. I mean, that is some long, long faces on that bench now. The defense, for, but for the most part, has played very well this year. Ranked among the top teams nationally defensively. With Baker down in the eye, and Stephen Garcia calls a timeout using South Carolina's first timeout of the second half with ten and a half minutes to go. Does that look like the face of a winning coach or a leading coach? Are we having fun yet? <laughs> Send a little shout out and a get well wish to Andrea Perone, uh, one of our production assistants. Here at ESPN, who's done a wonderful job over the course of the college football season. And we get well and uh, hope to see you soon once again. Eric Baker on the carry. And Martin making the stop on the play. A big part of our preparation for our games. Yeah, Andrea does a great job. Now, all, that, all the preparation work we get, all the emails, all the articles, all those little hidden nuggets that you come up with, people don't realize that's Andrea coming up with those nuggets for to have some great research assistants and Stephen LeBeau up here our number of specialists up in the booth along with Seth Jacobson keeping it all together on third down and six Garcia trying to keep it together but it's tripped up and brought down at the line of scrimmage at the 31 yard line and a red zone alert in the Texas Tech Texas game and a surprising result so far in that and Texas Tech right now up 12 nothing knocking on the door again at about the 18 yard line good stop right there for the Tennessee defense it looked like they were starting to cave a little bit this guy Ryan suck up right now an excellent kicker that's missing here lately but he has had an ab injury let's see if he's healthy again former first team all SEC performer this one coming from 48 yards out and they kick it he misses it but this one is going to be whistled dead because a Tennessee player Demetrius Morley came off sides I mean he really came off yeah, sides. Mark and I wouldn't be surprised here if Steve Spurrier doesn't go for this because I think it's going to be about fourth and Offside. one on the defense unabated to the quarterback that penalty is five yards from the previous spot it's still fourth down looks like the offense is coming back onto the field it's fourth down and one now boy how many penalties has the University of Tennessee had like that this season untimely ones on both sides of the football Garcia back on the field for the Gamecocks South Carolina 0 for 1 on fourth down tonight. Davis the deep back. He gets the carry and the first down. You know, Mike Davis came into the game averaging about four yards per rush. Has twice as many carries as anybody else on the team. Picked up about 10 on that play. He led the team in rushing as a freshman several years ago, but uh, after that gave way to a guy named Corey Boyd, who was pretty good now playing in the NFL. Corey Boyd ran hard now. You know, Mike Davis, knee surgery last spring. He actually had some fluid drained off his knee. Not 100% healthy. A young guy from right here in Columbia. Tenth play of the South Carolina drive. First Here's down the empty ten. formation. Here's the old Gator ball right here. <laughs> Garcia. Passes incomplete, intended for Eric Baker out of the backfield. Bob, you look at the numbers of South Carolina over Steve Spurrier's four-year tenure. They haven't really matched the offensive numbers that he had at Florida. Why? Well, you're being kind there. I mean, last year they were 77th in total offense. This year they're 79th in total offense. You know, the game's changed. I mean, to be quite honest, Steve was well ahead of his time schematically back at Florida. And, you know, they've just not had the consistent play of the quarterback. But I think they're on the right track right here. Right here. Right here. This is Mo Brown. Brown makes the catch, picks up six on the play. It'll be third down and about four coming up for the game comes. But yeah, we saw that empty formation, and uh, with Stephen Garcia now, might you see an offensive explosion of sorts over the next several years? You know, I asked Steve about that. You know, what happened to all of your empty formation stuff? And 
it's all about the quarterback in that because the focus is on the quarterback of making quick decisions because you only have five pass protectors. So Garcia does give them hope now. Baker the lone back, quick three-step drop. And it's batted down to the line of scrimmage by Dan Williams playing on that bad wheel of his, has a bad ankle, which was injured last week during that 29-9 loss against Alabama. He's one of the leaders up front. A lot of respect for this Tennessee defense. John Chavis, their defensive coordinator, <clears throat> excuse me, made a decision several weeks ago, John Chavis, to get up in the press box. Did that against Mississippi State, and he stayed up there, but they just keep playing. Ryan Suckup's field goal attempt coming from 31 yards out. He's 13 of 17 from this distance. Career lies and knocks this one right down Main Street. The Gamecocks now increasing their lead to 24 points. The defense pitching a shutout when we come back to Columbia. Max on Main featuring some good old-fashioned Southern cooking. A little blues and jazz and the crowd jumping here. In Columbia, great fans. These are great fans. And South Carolina doing an excellent job with their facilities. You know, we had a tour yesterday. Uh, Chris Matlock, their equipment guy, took us around, showed us the new training room. Great weight room, new locker room. I mean, he is close to getting over the hump in South Carolina. Bob, I love the fact that you've got hookups everywhere we go so I can get some running stuff. <laughs> You're not bashful about asking for it either. <laughs> Wendy Nix, I'm not too proud to beg. Back to you. <laughs> Good to hear it, Mark. How about a prime time pulse over on ABC? Texas Tech now leading Texas 19 0. A bit of a surprise in Lubbock. And on ESPN, Oklahoma and Nebraska 42 7. The Sooners steamrolling at this point. Six to go in the second quarter. All right, Wendy, we're going to start off first down and 10 from the 20 yard line. 7.33 to go, and Tennessee's offense has been vapid so far, lifeless. Stevens incomplete at the 43-yard line. Let's take a look at the All-State standings review. First Saturday in November, and things coming a little bit clearer now into focus. Yeah, number one right now down in Lubbock, Texas, the Longhorns. Oklahoma, imagine putting, I think it's 42 on Nebraska in the second quarter. Unbelievable. USC just toying with the Washington Huskies, and how about the Red Raiders yeah. and those Florida Gators sitting there? Hey, Bob, did you imagine? Did, did you imagine? I'll ask you maybe after this, but. Alabama sitting there at 9 and 0 the week off. I'm not sure how many people thought that they would be perfect at this point. Stevens complete his forward progress for Briscoe. Going to be up closer to the 30. Now they're going to mark it at the 27. Yeah, Briscoe with the catch. But you talk about Alabama, who I think beat Arkansas State today at home. My bad. You know, we had them in the Independence Bowl. You could see that Nick Saban, I mean, you knew Nick Saban would get it done, but Mark, to answer your question, nobody, including Nick Saban, thought they would be 9-0 right now. If you watch them on tape against Tennessee like we did last week, they are for real now. A great defense, strong physical running game, and John David, John Parker Wilson has improved as a quarterback. Third down and three. Stevens on the quick post, complete, out to the 42-yard line. Nice catch by number 21, Austin Rogers, picking up 15. Well, get your weekly dose of NFL news and analysis on ESPN tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Chris Burnham and then the crew with analysis and a whole bunch of highlights. NFL countdown presented by IBM. Then at 7, Berman and John Saunders delivered today's highlights and scores on SportsCenter presented by Bud Light. So after the completion, it's first down and 10. Arian Foster, the lone back for the Volunteers. Foster on the carry into the boundary, and Foster gets about four on the play, where he's hogtied by Captain Munnerlin and a late flag on the play. We get Captain Munnerlin, I believe, for a face mask over there on the volunteer sideline. It's interesting that let's take one more look at this first. Personal foul. 
face mask. Number 21 on the defense. That penalty is 15 yards. Added to the end of the run. Result of the penalty is a first down. You know, Tennessee has gone through a turbulent time over the last several months going back to uh, the suspension of their punter, Britton Colquick, and after that, they had a team meeting at their defensive captain's place, Alex Wilson, and they drafted a Tennessee player bill of rights and wrongs, which included an 11 p.m. curfew, fines for missing or being late for class or practice. They feel it's helped them take care of the little things off the field, which is led to a lack of major incidents off the field and the business at hand though they're trying to take care of things on the field scrambled by Nick Stevens you know Chris Culliver's had a good night for South Carolina wide receiver in 07 and he's a big tall good looking safety back there this may be the best defense in the Southeastern Conference. I know statistically they are, but they are athletic and they are deep, particularly in the secondary. Oh, Tennessee, 21 yards rushing tonight on 19 attempts before this one. And down to the 20, it's Arian Foster. You know, for Tennessee, that was a good hard run right there by Arian Foster, but Tennessee football under Phil Farmer, it all starts with the running game. And they came in a hundredth in the nation in rushing offense. Tennessee's game, they are more of a power team than a finesse team. If they can't run the football, they struggle. That's the reality, particularly with a new quarterback. It's going to take a lot to turn it around right here with 5.05 to go in the third quarter. A year ago, the victory against South Carolina proved to be a catalyst for a five-game winning streak and subsequently an appearance in the conference championship game and a New Year's Day Bowl. Stevens up top and incomplete. And a late flag thrown on the play against Jasper Brinkley trying to stay with the receiver on the play. Aaron Foster, the intended receiver. Yeah, South Carolina, a big man-to-man -man coverage team. You have Jasper Brinkley locked on Arian Foster right here. What do you think, Bob? Wow. Think, uh, First of all, I think it was uncatchable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was After a... Uh, Number 52 on the defense. I thought that was a bit of a That's gift right there. 15 now. yards from the previous spot and an automatic first down. Jasper Brinkley, one half of the Brinkley brothers. Uh, his brother Casper now playing in the NFL. Big guys seem to move pretty good in space. I don't know. 270-pound <laughs> linebacker coming back off a knee injury. Missed eight games last year. That's an NFL inside linebacker. I mean, that's a 3-4 inside linebacker that can play over that guard. He's better the NFL. He's better Casper with the Carolina Panthers. And defensive end. Under five minutes to go in the third quarter. Tennessee with its deepest penetration tonight. That's Foster, and he's brought down short of the goal line at about the one. Second down and goal. Tennessee has struggled in the red zone this year. Yes. We saw that uh, last week against Alabama. They had several chances, couldn't convert. Yeah, there's always a couple of things that lead to that. Number one, their field goal kicker has struggled. Number two, they don't really have a dynamic wide receiver, a big tall guy, and they have trouble running the football wherever it is. So that doesn't surprise me. That's the test. Foster up top. Trying to climb, and he does. Touchdown, Tennessee. Boy, he showed some width. <laughs> he has some hops. It always makes you nervous when they <laughs> stretch that football out, though, doesn't it? It's like the Putting out an offering there for the defense, but for Foster, you know, that underscores the struggles of the Tennessee running game this year. His first rushing touchdown, and measure that vertically. Oh, yeah, he's yeah. clearly crossed the plane of that goal line. Good effort. I mean, Arian Foster's playing hard right here in the second half. That's like it. Tennessee going to go for two, Mark. 23rd rushing touchdown of his career. Stevens going to try and run, and he's brought down. 
So they don't get the two-point conversion. Jordan Lindsay there to make the stop for South Carolina. Yeah, this South Carolina defense can run now. There's some great team speed out there. Twenty-four to six now. Tennessee finally getting on the scoreboard. Nick Stevens talking with his tailback, Aaron Foster, who scored his first touchdown of the season a few moments ago. It's the logic with Philip Fulmer right there is three eight make twenty-four. Is why he went for the two-point uh, conversion. I mean that point is argued by everybody. When do you kick the extra point? When do you start going for two? I really don't know the answer other than following that chart. But. Who drew that chart up? The, ma <laughs> the magic chart. That's what I want to know. Yeah. Was it magical scripture or something like that? that That's a good down? question. That's a good question. It's a mathematical guru somewhere. <laughs> you were the one that told me there are no gurus. I guess in coaching, that's different, <laughs> right? <laughs> 4.09 to go in the third quarter. I'm Mark Jones along with Bob Davy after the eight play 80 yard drive using 324 on the clock. 17 at Chris Culliver back to get this kickoff for South Carolina looking to improve to six and three on the season and an even up three and three in SEC conference play. Culliver. Got a little seam there on the left side. Culliver still on his feet. One got to be. And Culver pushed out of bounds at the 32. A big kickoff return for the Gamecocks. We said earlier Chris Culver's had a good night. Was a wide receiver last year. The patience right there. See how he just kind of choked it down, throttled down, let his blocking develop. Really a good effort right there, though, by number 29 from Tennessee. Stephen Reigns, freshman defensive back, saving that touchdown. 67 yard kickoff return for Culliver. Career long for him, and gives Stephen Garcia a shorter field to work with on the Tennessee 32 yard line. Well, momentum hard to get, hard to sustain for Tennessee, isn't it? Steve Spurrier calls a timeout. Timeout. South Carolina. Let's go back to Wendy Nix for a sports center right now. Mark, thank you very much. Texas Tech. Leading Texas 19-3 in the second quarter, Graham Harold to Eric Morris. Texas facing their fourth top 11 team in a row, perhaps their energy waning just a bit. And BYU defeating Colorado State by three, BYU trailing by four, under a minute to go until Max Hall connected to Dennis Pitta. They hold on and grab the win, 45-42 over Colorado State. All right, Wendy, back here with under four minutes to go in the third quarter after the timeout. First and 10 from the 32 yard line for South Carolina. South Carolina trying to expunge the memory of a five game losing streak to end last season. Right now sitting at five and three and really optimistically hoping to win out although a big one coming up against Florida soon. Garcia hands it off. That's Davis and a flag down on the play right near the line of scrimmage. Let's take a look at tonight's AutoZone playbook and some of the cogent points of tonight's game. Well, I think where we head with this is Steven Garcia, his ability to keep plays alive with his mobility in the pocket. Reminds me a little bit of this guy playing out in Lubbock, Texas tonight, Colt McCoy. One of those guys that's athletic enough, can throw on the run well enough. What do you think? Yeah. Big improvement, at least, for Steven Garcia between, between games one and two. Yeah, he's a freshman. Red shirt freshman. Tennessee may have been a little quick off the line of scrimmage, and they make the interception. That's Eric Berry. And Barry with thoughts of bringing this one back. Oh, look out. Still on his time. He plays offense, too. Oh, got a nice block. Barry's still on the road. 
and brought down at the 43. Maybe not as much brought down as just kind of ran out of steam. Well, it started with, I thought Tennessee was off sides. Wes Brown on the pressure. And someone's missing their hat. I think there were two guys. And Garcia is hurt on the play. Shows you how physical that last play was. Just a bizarre series of events right there. A couple of injured players down in the field. One of them, Garcia. And yet able to identify the second player. Wow. Mark, you know, offsides is not reviewable. I think he was clearly offsides at the bottom of the screen. And Wes Brown was a little quick out of the starting blocks. Now Eric Berry, as good as any playmaker in the country, he had 10 interceptions coming in for 397 return yards. <laughs> And he picked up a fumble. The block right there by Morley, the safety. Now we get another block right there. And there's two South Carolina players down. There's Garcia, and that's not a good sign for the Gamecocks. Remember, Garcia became the starting quarterback just two games ago, and that's number 57, Lemuel Jean-Pierre, being helped off the field as well. For Barry, meanwhile, it was his sixth interception of the season. And Chris Smelly is the backup quarterback for South Carolina. So on one play, they potentially lose two players. And perhaps giving new life to Tennessee and Arian Foster. Yeah, I don't think there's any question about that. Can Tennessee execute enough? But let's look at it. Was he offside? I mean, there isn't any doubt. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt, Mark, that he's across that neutral zone right there. Again, that's not reviewable. I want to see where Garcia got hurt on the interception return. Max working out of the eye. Foster tries to cut back, stopped up about two yards short of the first down. It's third down and two to come for the Volunteers. The thing that surprises me, and I know Tennessee's down, just not much emotion. I mean, I look out there at their offense on the field. You look at their sidelines. I mean, there's not much juice or enthusiasm. I mean, this game is still alive right now. Well, you certainly can't make that claim about Barry. Making exactly. that interception a few moments ago. And you know this is four down territory, so they're going to run the football here. They line up in the eye. They give it to the fullback for a change. That's Kevin Cooper. And Cooper looks like they're going to mark it about a foot or two short of the first down, setting up a fourth down and that much to go. And as you mentioned, it's a fourth down territory for the Volunteers. I'll tell you. You play football at a place like Tennessee, these players are under amazing stress. And all the stuff about the coach's hot seat, and these guys read the newspaper, I mean, it's a cumulative effect now. And you can just kind of read into it over there on the sidelines. There's not many guys up there watching this offense trying to claw back into this game. There's a lot of little pockets of guys in conversations over there. It's interesting, Bob. Last week we saw Tyrone Willingham the siege coach out at University of Washington this week. Same situation for Philip Fulmer. It is a tricky profession when you're trying to rally young men and motivate them in light of the circumstances. Fourth and one, they're going for it. Tennessee 0 for 1 on fourth down tonight. Quarterback sneak, you think? I'd say so. Stevens keeps it. Boy, if he got it, he didn't get it by much. Wow, that is incredibly close. Not much push up front, Bob. I mean, it is. looks like it's a hair short based on the spot right here. Again, there's no more exact science. Try to come in and mark that football right there and find where that football is down in that mass of humanity. Yeah. I mean, you talk about an inexact science. <laughs> but I think for the most part, you're, you're guessing at least just a little bit. Oh, it's short. Tennessee has come up about that short on the season. That has been symbolic of the season for Philip Fulmer and his volunteers. 
but remaining resolute in the face of adversity on the sidelines is the 17 year head coach of Tennessee. First down and 10, the Gamecocks coming back the other way. Yeah, Chris Smelly in the game now. If you're just joining us, Stephen Garcia was shaken up on the interception return a few moments ago. With he and Jean Pierre, the offensive lineman. Hence, we have a new quarterback, Chris Smelly, who started the first six games prior to Garcia taking over. That's Davis gaining about three on the play. Well, Jimmy Johnson continues his march toward a third straight Sprint Cup title as the rest of the chase field tries to hold him back. The chase for the NASCAR Sprint Cup continuing with the Dickies 500 at Texas on ABC tomorrow afternoon. Coverage begins with NASCAR countdown at 3 Eastern. Back. Garcia is still on the sidelines. And uh, yeah, Tommy Beecher started the year as the number one guy gave way to Chris Smelly for the next six games and then two games ago Garcia took over so we'll see how long Chris Smelly gets to take the snaps Davis cutting it back nicely he got about six well, it's all about running the football right now for South Carolina Smelly with ten touchdowns but nine interceptions on the season plenty talented enough he's just been inconsistent not a bad record as a career starter. Eight and four, including the 4 0 this year. Again, another big down for the Tennessee defense. Third and three, Brown in motion. They run it. And that's going to be close. Well, they're as conservative <laughs> offensively as I've ever, ever seen a Steve Spurrier football team. And they're working on that right foot. It's like knee, I think. They're going to put that knee right leg. In, huh? And that's the end of the third period of play. Tennessee with the lead when we come back to Columbia. Election day. I cast my ballot already, Bob Davis. So did I. The great state of Florida. So did I in the great state of Arizona. <laughs> my wife Joanne gave me a lot of help on that ballot, I must confess. <laughs> did your homework for you? <laughs> or at least help you, sorry. This is Rogan on the pump return, brought down at the 13 yard line. And number three, nice tackle by Akeem Augusti, a 48 yard punt, and three yards on the return. Texas threatening now against Texas Tech in a pivotal game in the Big 12 South Division. And Texas Tech leading that game. Game over on ABC. First down and 10 for the Volunteers. This is the first Saturday in November. They come into this game three and five. And their head coach, Philip Fulmer, looking to try to spark his team. intercepted for the second time tonight by Culliver. That was a dangerous throw by Nick Stevens. Well, Jean-Pierre really see distraught. Motion, don't you? Anytime you see that ice on that knee, those knee injuries. Wow. It says a lot right there. You know how much that young man has invested. And all of a sudden, that knee scares every young player. Stevens, 8 of 18 on the night. Heat. And he dumps it incomplete, intended for Foster on the screen. But Eric Norwood turned up the pressure meter on Nick Stevens. Mark, this South Carolina defense is all over the Tennessee wide receivers. I don't know that I've seen a game where every ball, every throw has been contested with such tight coverage. I mean, every throw is tight, and you combine that with great pressure up front. I mean, they are swarming. They are swarming Tennessee's offense. So a quick shot of Ellis Johnson, the team's defensive coordinator up top. A homecoming for him to the state of South Carolina. His defense playing well tonight. Third down and 10 for the Volunteers. Stevens under heat again. Yeah. Cannot escape. 
A relentless, tireless, indomitable South Carolina defense making the stack. Led by Cliff Matthews. Right, and Ellis Johnson again blitzing. Brought Stoney Woodson, the DB. I mean, they are blitzing them at will right now because there's no fear in the South Carolina defense that the Tennessee wide receivers can make them pay for playing man-to-man -man coverage. Captain Munnellen perched at his 45. Holka punting from the shadows of his own goalpost, five yards deep. Wow. Well, he he gets a that. rocket. Munnellen all the way back at the 32. And nowhere to go. Swarmed. And then still on his feet. Wow. He emerged from a pack of would-be tacklers at the 37. A 55-yard punt, though, by Britton Colquitt. Back with more from Columbia right after this. Munnerlin, one of the leaders of that South Carolina defense. Look at those statistics. What do they tell you, Bob? Tell me it's complete domination right now by the South Carolina defense, particularly when it comes to pressure on the quarterback, negative plays created, and tight man-to-man -man coverage. The Tennessee offense has only rushed for 39 yards, rushing the ball here for South Carolina is Mike Davis at about three on the play. South Carolina came in with a bit of a hot hand. They had won four of their last five games. The only loss coming to the hands of LSU a couple of weeks ago. And they kind of did things right seemingly so far anyway during that bye week that they're coming off. They practiced Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday and Coach Spurrier gave the team the weekend off. Got back to work on Monday and uh, it's been all good tonight so far. Davis running hard between the tackles. And no reason for South Carolina to be anything but conservative right now. Big concern is the health of Steven Garcia, the quarterback. You'd like to get Smelly some opportunities to throw the football right here, but you know exactly what he's thinking. Just keep that clock moving. And don't let Eric Berry intercept the pass because he's Tennessee's best offense right now. <laughs> Third down and four coming up. Smelly moves into the shotgun. And the play clock all the way down. And Smelly is brought down to the 37. So it's fourth down coming up. You know, you have to give a little bit of credit to Wes Brown on that play and the entire Tennessee defense. They're, they're still bringing a little bit of heat and playing hard. We've seen that look right there. I mean, Steve Spurrier does not hide his emotions. That's kind of that sarcastic, disgusted <laughs> look right there. That's not the run and gun, fun and shoot, whatever he called yeah. it in Florida. But yeah, I mean, Rico McCoy, the linebacker, and then Wes Brown, 94, continue to make plays now. Dennis Rogan back at his own 17 for Tennessee. Nice punt by Lannon. Rogan brought down immediately at the 23-yard line. Like I said, uh, Coach Spurrier, after this 39-yard punt, not many guys can smile picture, and be upset. Is a picture worth a thousand words? A million of that. Does that not say it all right there, look? ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by the Volkswagen Rutan, the only minivan in America with German engineering. Welcome back, everyone, to Columbia. I'm Mark Jones, along with Bob Davies, South Carolina leading Tennessee. 24 to 6 right now with 11 and a half minutes to go in the fourth quarter. Steve Spurrier's image uh, seemingly everywhere. Here in Columbia. Pass incomplete on the quick three step drop intended for number 12, Lucas Taylor. You know, interesting, Bob, that we haven't seen offensively much of Eric Berry. And they had talked about putting him on the offensive side of the ball as Jean Pierre has helped off the field for South Carolina. But I guess part of the issue for Barry playing offense at the defense well, field. So. And they have so many problems with execution on offense. How do you take away reps in practice from your offense to practice Eric Barry? I mean, it's tough now. Second down and 10.
pass complete at the 30 yard line. Stocker making the catch. How about that visit to Steve Spurrier's office yesterday, huh? I mean, he's got some great mementos in that office. He has his Heisman Trophy in there. Yeah, the, the, the second of the same Heisman. It was interesting how when he was awarded his Heisman Trophy, he gave one to the school where he won it. And he was told by an associate it might be a good move and did so. And he was the recipient of a second one by the Heisman people. That catch complete. Yeah, I think a false start right here. I would think. You know now, Bob. They, back. Sorry, Bob. They make two Heisman's now, and that trend actually started with Steve Spurrier because he gave the Heisman yeah. to the school. Yeah. yeah. This is interesting. The hands on the hips, kind of the gunslinger look. <laughs> and then I didn't realize he also kicked at Florida. So not only was a a quarterback there is with the square toe. <laughs> it wasn't a soccer style. Huh? Kick. No, no, <laughs> no. Very gracious yesterday. Took a lot of time with us. I think he really feels like this football team is on track. Nothing's going to be easy in this conference. The only thing that's a little sour and offbeat with him now is the fact he's got a little bit of a knee issue. Kind of yeah, with so it. he has to have that knee replaced probably. It's his left knee. Tough on the golf swing. That pass incomplete at the 40-yard line. Intended for Taylor, the team's leading receiver coming in. You know, Steve is a an excellent golfer. Said he doesn't even think about bringing those clubs out during the season because just excellent golfer. Said he doesn't even think about bringing those clubs out during the season because just mentally, there's no way you could focus or concentrate on golf right now. Works out every day of the week, but Sunday takes Sunday off. Coaching such a. Uh... Consuming profession. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know about, Davey. I'm just telling you, the thing that makes me nervous right here. These three big guys continue to back up and come very close to Colquitt. That time, with no pressure, they didn't back up there. Unerland driven back, and Colquitt drives one back again. They're going to get a chance to down this one inside the five. Do you think wow. Eric Berry and Colquitt? For the two biggest weapons Tennessee has on this football team. The two best things they've got going right now are affecting field position positively for Tennessee. Should have a movie on it. I mean, he yeah. blasted that one. These guys are enjoying themselves over there, aren't they? I'm not sure how <laughs> appropriate the smiles are at the moment. Well, you know, sometimes you just see bits and pieces of things, kind of like the Josh Briscoe incident right. last week on, on camera. So, you know, I don't put too much into that. I know how, how much these guys care. Davis with a two yard gain and that should make his coach smile and speaking of the smiles and the different faces etched across the countenance of Steve Spurrier. Is it ever really an all out smile Bob I'm trying to figure that out. No and he's winning <laughs> 24 to 6 right now. That's one thing about coaching I mean until it is over you never ever ever enjoy it. Sometimes you don't even exhale no, when it's, it's over, right? Meanwhile, the story a lot different on the other side of the field for Philip Fulman. Nine and a half minutes to go. South Carolina leading 24 to 6. Davis picks up another three and a half, four yards. It is time for the conservative approach. You know this Tennessee defense. You look at their linebackers. You know, it's kind of become the new linebacker you you know they've had something like 11 guys drafted since 99 we look at Wilson right there Jared Mayo last year number 10 pick by New England have done a great job of taking some kind of undersized guys that would be strong safeties maybe at other places and just taking advantage of their playmaking but I think they've kind of passed Penn State as the linebacker you interesting is complete. That's Saunders with the grab and a first down. <laughs> On the eve of this year's election, two of the NFL's best battle in the nation's capital. So cast your vote to watch Big Ben and the Steelers take on Clinton Portis and Washington. Monday Night Football on ESPN at 8.30 Eastern Time. Coverage beginning at 7 Eastern with Monday Night Countdown delivered by 
UPS. Now, Chris Berman, mm -hmm. at halftime, they're going to show an interview with Barack Obama and John McCain, right? Yeah. That shows you how big Monday night football, what an institution that is across the country, right? Big, big sports fans, candidates. Yeah. Bobby Wallace in, that tailback, and he gets this carry. Wallace with a nice little shake over the 30 out to the 34 yard line. An 11 yard pickup for South Carolina as we approach eight minutes to go here in the fourth quarter. A good effort by Adam Myers White, number 48, the linebacker from Tennessee, just chasing that football. Have you ever seen a Steve Spurrier team run the football as much in one football game? This may be a record if we can go back and look at statistics of run compared to pass. The times really have changed when it comes to Coach Spurrier's crews. Well, when you have a defense like they have going tonight, there's no reason to take a chance. Mike Davis on the run, and Davis brought down behind the line of scrimmage, flagged down on the play. Let's go to Wendy Nix. Mark, thank you. LSU has won 21 straight regular season games against non-conference opponents. How would they fare against Tulane? Keelan Williams, the three-yard plunge into the end zone, has LSU on top 28-3, to about five minutes left in the third quarter. I coached in that game, Tulane, LSU, when I was at Tulane. What do you remember most about it? I remember a huge fight that occurred in Baton Rouge in 1984. And everyone came out of the stands and they called the game with about three minutes left in the game. They wow. Had to, I mean, that is a big, big rivalry, rivalry game. Now, years ago, that was really a big rivalry. They called the game with how much time to go? I think three minutes. Seven and a half to go here. I was coaching defense. And LSU What'd was you do moving that ball so well. I was kind of glad it was over. <laughs> <laughs> it helped the stats a little bit. You know, we didn't have three minutes to finish. Davis on the run off the handoff from Chris Smelly. And Smelly is taken over from Stephen Garcia. If you're just joining us, Garcia was injured a few series ago on an interception return. You know, you look at the Southeastern Conference. Looks like it's headed for an Alabama, Florida, SEC championship game. And that will be a great game. Yeah. Now, who else in the national exactly. championship game? I mean, Penn State, Joe Paterno's hip feels better tonight now watching that Texas-Texas Tech game because that's a huge, huge advantage for Penn State if, if, the, if the Red Raiders can hang on. Now. Davis again with a gaping hole side of that offensive line and picks up about nine. Yeah, Penn State, you would assume, would run the table from here on out as we take a look at the SEC standings first. Yeah, and you have Florida going to Nashville and playing Vanderbilt next week. Georgia at Kentucky, but Florida obviously in the driver's seat now with an impressive win today. Can we call that a trap game next week between Florida and Vandy? Could be. Okay. Could be, but I just think Florida's too talented. But Alabama still going to LSU, and the emotions in that stadium on the Nick Saban bowl game in Baton Rouge will be unbelievable. Might be a little bit of history there. And a great punt by Spencer Lanning driving Rogan back inside the 10. And Rogan brought down at the 14-yard line, and there's a fumble. Gamecocks have it at the 14-yard line after the 51-yard punt. South Carolina covering that punt with bad intentions, and they caused the turnover. Charles Turner, the deep snapper, recovering the ball. I think it was number three, Akeem Augusti. They have two number threes listed, but I think that was Augusti, the defensive back, that knocked that football out of there. Wow, Mark. And 5.36 to go, and uh, a lot of luck for Phil Fulmer, but it, unfortunately it's been all bad tonight. Third turnover of the game. McKinley in motion. 
to give it to Davis, trying to cut it back, and he stopped up after a gain of about two. Under five and a half minutes to go. One thing you teach on defense, it doesn't matter how they got the football or where they got the football. It's your job to go out and stop them, regardless of the circumstances. But you can just imagine how difficult it is for this Tennessee defense to just keep going out there and competing. Approaching five minutes to go, Davis, a very efficient but not spectacular 24 rushes for 55 yards tonight, a career high 24 carries. Davis again. This offense over the last quarter, Bob Davy, has been Davis left to Davis right and Davis between the tackles. He might be in the wishbone. <laughs> he may all of a sudden take Paul Johnson's <laughs> offense at Georgia Tech and say, you know what? I've got a really good defense. My quarterbacks are still a little inconsistent. I'm going to run the ball. You think there's any chance Steve Spurrier no, will take no, that? No, 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 no. <laughs> You've seen some strange things. I mean, who would have thought now? I mean, Mike Davis, 25 carries. South Carolina rush offense number 108 coming into this game. Kelly back to pass over the middle. And Sanders, what a catch. Touchdown. Yeah, we got a flag. That says it all, doesn't it? This one might be coming back. Well, according to the look on Coach Spurrier's. That play. might have been an illegal formation right there. It looked kind of quick when they got to the line. Illegal formation on the offense. Only six men on the line of spin. Five guys from the previous spot. Yeah. Replay third down. There was obvious confusion because on the snap of the football, watch these guys up here. They never even move. Look, it's like... <laughs> Look. Yeah. How about the catch, though? One-handed, 285-pound Wesley Saunders, the most disappointed guy in this entire... <laughs> you think Steve Spurrier's disappointed? <laughs> Reed said Saunders showed some, some good mobility and dexterity with those hands on that touchdown catch and run he had against LSU a couple of weeks ago. He's kind of a blocking tight end, too. Oh, Davis, and what a stick. McCoy coming up from his linebacker spot and making a nice hit on Mike Davis and saying, at that time. A little pent-up frustration being let out. Yeah, there, were, there were actually a lot of boos in the stadium over you heard them too, right? I heard them. <laughs> Conservative play call. And nobody in orange is left in the stadium. So it wasn't Tennessee fans booing now. <laughs> In comes Ryan Suckup to attempt the field goal. This one's going to be from 31 yards out straight away. Suckup, the former All-SEC selection, has struggled this year, but knocks that one through to make it 27 to 6. Well, and that's a difficult situation. I mean, Philip Fulmer knows exactly what's going to be in that morning paper tomorrow in Knoxville and exactly what the reaction is going to be. I mean, he is not naive. Rogan watches it bounce into the end zone, and Tennessee will start off on its own 20-yard line. Bob, when you look at the big picture nationally, we talked about Penn State undefeated, seemingly ready to run the table in the Big Ten Conference, and then at the end of the year, Alabama undefeated right now in the SEC. If there's a one-loss SEC team that doesn't get into the national championship game and Penn State does get in, we have the usual uproar. Right? Yeah, and, in, and particularly after the SEC the last two years has won the national championship. Yeah. LSU last year with two losses of Florida the year before beating Ohio State. That's the problem right now with the Big 12 and the SEC. They can beat each other up, and they both have to play conference championship games. So you're looking at Penn State right now. First, their schedule at Iowa, at Indiana, and Michigan State. That's the best schedule. Alabama has to go to LSU, plus probably going to get Florida down here in a conference championship. Texas, if they can win tonight, has a great schedule. But they're behind in Lubbock. So 
The bottom line in Texas Tech's schedule, we'll look at in a minute, is very difficult. So Penn State in great situation. And the controversy can come down to USC oh. at one loss yep. compared to a Big 12 or a Southeastern Conference team. Backside pressure. Nick Stevens almost got away, but is sacked by Eric Norwood at the 15-yard line. Norwood has been in on a lot of plays tonight. He's a uh, 16 sack of the night for South Carolina. Mark, a versatile guy, Eric Norwood. Not a bad time to get him over there on the sidelines and watch the end of this game. Whoever <laughs> his backup is, be a good time to see some playing time for that backup. Third and 15 for Tennessee. Here's Norwood up here at the top again. Hey, so what's wrong with getting some stats, Bob? More pressure. <laughs> Complete at the 17-yard line to Arian Foster. Back to testing Texas Tech, leading right now against Texas over on ABC. 8-0. Yeah, that is a tough schedule. Oklahoma State, here's the one. Uh, you're going to Norman, and then Baylor is an improved team, plus a Big 12 championship. So if Texas Tech beats Texas tonight, that's the yeah. best thing that could happen for Penn State because I don't think the Red Raiders can run that schedule right there. Wow. Where Texas, if they could win tonight, I think Texas will run the table. So Joe Paterno, man, that hip and that knee, which he's going to have to have surgery on after right. the season, it's feeling pretty good tonight. Nobody talking about, oh, he's upstairs right now. Maybe he should step <laughs> away from the yeah. game. And, you know, some of the preseason controversies with some of the off-field incidences that they had at Penn State suddenly have not become the major well, story that they were before. Nobody talking about Philip Fulmer, 150 and 50 right. at Tennessee. No NCAA problems over his years. It's all about that W. Right, Wendy Nix? It's yeah. all about winning. It is all about winning. It's a what have you done for me lately kind of business. Texas Tech knows that. They're up 22 to 6 over on ABC. And of course on ESPN, Sports Center coming up after this game. Oklahoma 56, Nebraska 21. Wendy, when Bob said it was all about the W, I thought he meant it was all about Wofford. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I give you a little nugget. You can't let it go. <laughs> Two minutes to go. Will bounce at the 36-yard line, going out of bounds. And folks, get your weekly dose of NFL news and analysis on ESPN tomorrow at 11 a.m. Chris Berman hosts Sunday NFL Countdown presented by IBM. With Mike Ditka, Tom Jackson, Steve Young, Chris Carter, and Keyshawn Johnson. Then at 7 on ESPN, Chris Berman and John Saunders give you the highlights and scores on SportsCenter presented by Bud Light. Mark, what do you think? The South Carolina team... Excellent on defense, as good as any. I think they're about over that hump. I think they can go to Gainesville with this defense and contest the Gators. I really think they can be competitive, too. When you look at what they've done in the SEC so far this year, their three losses, they're all one touchdown games. Right? This is number 22 in the game. Bobby Wallace getting the carry in South Carolina's remaining schedule. Pretty good one. Yeah, favored against Arkansas at home. At Florida, they'll be the underdogs. At Clemson, tough. That's tough. Clemson beat Boston College today, right? Yeah, they sure did. A rivalry game, and they do get a week off in between. Yeah, so next week's game against Arkansas, huge, because that would get them to seven wins. Last year, they were 6-6 six and six. South Carolina. Didn't go to a bowl game, so 7-5 and five gets them in a bowl game. On second down and eight. Bobby Wallace once again on the carry. Picks up a couple of yards. And as we said at the top of the show, one of the prevailing themes coming in was the job security issue or lack thereof of Philip Fulmer, the head coach for 17 years at Tennessee. He won a national championship with the team back in 1998 as a couple of SEC titles to his credit. And Scott Spurrier, Steve's son, is in the game at wide receiver right here. That's his son. I think he's about five foot three, is the second team holder getting a little PT tonight. Let's see if he gets a block. A block? Throw him the rock. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Sp 
Spurrier's on the sidelines, one up in the booth, one down on the field as a player, one as the coach. And well, Phil Fulmer's team falls now to one and five in SEC conference play and three and six overall. Steve Spurrier, South Carolina Gamecocks, improving to six and three. And it's the first win at home against Tennessee since 19. 92 snapping that seven game home losing streak against the Volunteers. Well, South Carolina proved to be opportunistic.